today on Straight Talk Africa, a candid conversation on the historical political dynamics of the Ugandan Kingdom of Buganda, based on a new book titled Protection, Patronage or Plunder. That discussion with the author is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali, and today we are discussing the political past and present of the Ugandan Kingdom of Buganda. 57 years after the independence of Uganda from colonial rule, the Buganda Kingdom continues to play a significant role in the country. This cultural institution has served as an essential support base for politicians spearheading cultural and development programs. Paul Ndiho produced this report and narrated by Esther Gidui Uwat. At the top of Mengo Hill in Uganda's bustling capital Kampala, home of the Buganda Kingdom symbolizes the country's rich history of the monarchy. The Buganda Kingdom is one of Uganda's four kingdoms, and perhaps it is the most influential politically and strategically. Buganda rose to power in the 19th century, becoming the dominant kingdom in the region. Its first direct contact with Europeans was established in 1862. In 1884, Mutesa the Kabaka of Buganda died, and his son Mwanga II took over. In 1892, Mwanga signed a treaty with Captain Lord Lugard, giving Buganda the status of a protectorate under the authority of the British East African Company. When Uganda achieved independence in 1962, the Buganda Kingdom was given considerable autonomy and was accorded special federal status within the new nation. Buganda's insistence upon its separate political identity generated worsening tensions with the central government. In 1966, conflict broke out between the Buganda ruler Mutesa II and the Prime Minister of Uganda, Milton Obote, who in 1967 abolished Buganda and the country's three other traditional kingdoms. The Buganda Kingdom was not restored until 1993. Today, the Buganda Kingdom has the largest tribe, Baganda, and they pride themselves as having a unique culture, good morals, and a close association with other clans. The Baganda were instrumental in Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni's rise to power 33 years ago. He based his five-year military struggle in the kingdom's heartland, Luero. Since then, the Baganda have supported and helped him to stay in power. But a long simmering dispute over land and power between President Museveni's government and the Buganda Kingdom has persisted for a long time. The Kabaka wants more autonomous control over resources in his kingdom, such as land and taxes. But the government says he is only a cultural figure and must steer clear of politics. The disputes over land and power with Buganda sparked violent protests in 2009 that killed dozens of people. Demonstrators, mostly youths from the Baganda tribe, blocked roads and set fire to vehicles and tires, protesting the decision to stop the Kabaka, Ronald Muwenda Mutebi, from visiting a part of his kingdom in the Kayunga district in the eastern area of the Buganda kingdom. A couple of months later, fire gutted a mausoleum built in 1860 and destroyed much of the Kasubi tombs, the final resting place of the kings of Buganda and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The cause of the blaze has never been determined and reconstruction of the tombs is still ongoing. For producer Paul Diho, I'm Esther Gido Ewart. And thanks Paul and Esther for that interesting report. Joining me now here in Washington is Apollo Nelson Makubuya, Chief Paris Advisor for the Ugandan Kingdom of Buganda. He is also the author of Protection, Patronage, or Plunder, British Machinations, and Buganda's Struggle for Independence. Well, I have to say, Apollo, that uh, I am profoundly honored 
and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Thank you. Thank you, Shaka. It's an honor for me to be here in your studios. I've always seen and watched your shows, and I'm very, very honored to be here in front of uh, uh, your, your viewers. It's very interesting because I recall that several years ago, a friend of mine, uh, Ambassador Moses Sebunya, took me to your farm, and we had a very good time. We had an exchange of social amenities. Little did I know at some point, you would in fact be my guest on Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Thank you. It's great to be here. You're most welcome. Let me, first of all, before we get into the subject at hand, uh, let me ask you to reflect on the death, the passing of a former Kenyan president, Daniel Toroitik Arap Moi, uh, who I think is being buried actually this week. Um, yes, um, the late President Moi was uh, one of those leaders in Africa who uh, represented an order that was promising in, 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 in Kenya and in the region in East Africa. Um, it's very sad that he has passed away at an old age. I think that the people of Kenya, while they mourn him, uh, those of us in Uganda and other African countries join them to mourning the passing of their leader. Uh, history shows that, you know, President Moy had a, a mixed kind of uh, legacy in both in Kenya and in the region. But as far as Uganda is concerned, we, we, we saw that he helped us at a difficult time when there were negotiations between the regime of uh, Tito Okello and uh, the then fighting group of the NRA. I think he tried to facilitate talks between uh, these entities, which resulted in the Nairobi Peace Accord. So to that extent, you know, we, we remember him. But we also remember him for helping Kenya undergo a transition from one leader to another leader. You know, when Mwai Kibaki took over from Moi, very few people thought or believed that an African president would allow for a successor to take over power in a peaceful way. A smooth, peaceful transition of power from one party to another party That's in the right. opposition. That's right. That was so, so to that extent, you know, in spite of all that may be said about uh, President Moy, I think he will be remembered for that uh, political decision and uh, his ability to have left the political stage and lived a private life and continue to be of influence and uh, use to his people. To have been able to negotiate his exit peacefully. Correct. You know, he was a very interesting man. He took me at least seven years before I could get or secure the first interview with the President Daniel Toroitik Arap Moi. Seven years? Seven years. He was not very easy to interview. He did not. Uh, uh, he did not pretty much feel very comfortable to be interviewed really by journalists. As a matter of fact, the other journalists that I know who interviewed him a couple of times also was um, a Tanzanian journalist called Tido Muhando, mm. who used to work for the BBC and currently works for Azam Television in Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I met President Moi in 1999 in Dar es Salaam, when I had gone to pay my last respects to another giant of the region who had just passed away, and that was Mwarimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. Mm -hmm. I remember I was coming from Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo capital. I had just uh, interviewed another very inaccessible African president, Rora Desire Kabira in Rubumbashi. 
Ooh. And uh, I was introduced to Mr. Moi mm. by the then Tanzanian Foreign Minister, Jakaya Murisho Kikwete, mm. who in his own right, of course, subsequently also became president of the Tanzania. president of Tanzania. Mm. And uh, Mr. Moi asked me if I could meet him in Nairobi. And I said, sure. So I subsequently flew to Nairobi and uh, got my first interview with President Moy. And I recall asking him almost the same question that I've asked you. I asked him, in fact, to reflect and react on the passing of a former colleague of his, Mwarimu Julius Kambaragenyere, is passing away. And he said, Shaka, Mwarimu and I were on first name basis. He used to call me Daniel. Mm -hmm. I used to call him Mwarimu. And he said he is a man I respected so much, especially because if you can remember, he said in 1961, Mwarimu offered to delay the, the independence of Tanganyika so that both Kenya and Uganda would be free in order for the three countries to join the East, Afri you know, East African Federation, of which he said, Marim was prepared uh, for Jomo Kenyatta, who was older to be the first president of the East African Federation. And he said, unfortunately, it wasn't to be. And in fact, it is very interesting because in reading your book, mm -hmm. Protection, Patronage, Plunder, you mention something about the East African community. Correct. And how the Kabaka of Buganda at the time, mm -hmm. Sir Edward Frederick uh, Mutesa II. Correct. Was very uncomfortable about that. He was, yes. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, President Moy, as you said, uh, obviously uh, was meant different things to different people. But for the most part, I think you could look at him as a symbol of stability and peace in Kenya and in the region. Even though I'm one of those people who say that uh, peace and stability is not necessarily the absence of war, Correct. the absence of violence, yes. but rather the presence of social, economic, political justice for all. Yeah, right. Yeah, let me come to your book. Yes. First of all, Apollo, congratulations. Thank you. It's a very good book. Thank you very much. And as a historian, a history student, mm. I have to say that you put in a lot of work. Thank you. It's, I did. It seems to be remarkably well researched, except that um, I have something about the methodology. Go on. What do you have? When you think about it, uh, you write this book largely from uh, the British colonial political lens of experience in terms of the archives and all that kind of stuff, documents and you name it. What about the African side? Well, I could... The Buganda, uh, Uganda, and what have you. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you talk about methodology, and, and thank you very much for the, your kind uh, uh, compliments. In, in, in terms of methodology, there, there are different ways that one can acquire information. History is a subject that requires people to go down deep and dig uh, about facts and events and people who happen to be in place many, many years ago before. To be creative. Yeah. Or so, 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 so you need to, kind of stuff. to have access to original materials. Mm. Um, and in my case, I was fortunate enough to come across um, some of these materials in the British archives, right. the national um, archives in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. But I also interviewed a couple of people who mm. were alive and mm -hmm. who participated in these, in these really? proceedings. Yes. One of them is the late Edi Luboa. Mm -hmm. Edi Luboa was a prominent um, activist in, in the Kingdom of Uganda. He mm. was a, a former Attorney General. He was a Speaker of the Parliament yes. and so on. I talked to the late Manjankanji when he was still alive. I knew him. 
Um, I talked to other professors in Uganda, Professor Wangalu Nyigo, Professor Semakula Chuanuka, Professor Mutibwa, Professor Sempebwa. Those are impeccable so, historians. Yes, so although the predominant sources were these archives, I, I think that I, I tried to, to balance it with, with my own uh, knowledge and access to, to, to the sources that are in Uganda. But what is unique about the book is that um, um, it relies on material that has not been available for many historians because um, the release of these documents, they are formally classified. They are classified. Yeah, so, so it's inaccessible to many people because of cost and access and so on. Mm. So you will find, maybe you will be an exception, but you will find many people haven't got an opportunity to see or to learn or to hear about this narrative. It's a different narrative. And I'm not just picking material and re reproducing it. Mm -hmm. I'm putting an analysis to it and comparing events and personalities and so on. Because, for example, um, our history has been pre dominant, predominantly based on a Eurocentric view, you know, how the missionaries saw, for example, actors such as Mwanga and how they treated the matters, mm. how the missionaries saw people like Apollo Kagwa and lionized him in the context of our history. But once you have a chance to refresh this history mm -hmm. and to, 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 to rewrite it, to redefine it. It helps you to reframe the narrative. To look at the context. Correct. And, and to, to see the other side of the story because the narrative that we are seeing predominantly is one that portrays Britain and the empire as benevolent, as a civilizing force, as a force for good. Certainly not for the people that were colonized, you remind but me, for the empire. Now that you say that, uh, you remind me of uh, um, a former Scottish missionary, mm -hmm. doctor with a clinic, physician, and explorer, mm -hmm. Dr. David Livingstone. Yes. He basically talked about, uh, he came up with the three C's. Yes. Which uh, the British used to justify their colonial experience yes. in Africa. And the three C's were Christianity, mm -hmm. civilization, mm -hmm. and, and commerce. commerce. Correct. But in fact, at the end of the day, really, it was commerce. It was pri <laughs> primarily the motivation. Yes. Primarily and, that motivation. And now for you, you come up with what they would call three P's. That's right. You talk about protection. Mm -hmm. Patronage, mm -hmm. Flander. Yes. I wonder why you couldn't add the fourth P, paternalism. <laughs> First of all, it would have been a mouthful of a title, but more importantly, it is captured under the theme of patronage, because paternalism and patronage are more or less uh, similar. And I show that um, it's a continuum, you know, this patronage mm -hmm. and the promotion of. Uh, British prestige, uh, British influence, not just in Uganda, but across the British Empire. They controlled, of course, uh, the empire where the sun never, never set. set. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you know, from one end of the world to another. So right. you, are, you would be in some part of the British Empire. Right. Yeah, but although the sun set at the empire, because after the independence period which you were talking about, mm the sun set on the empire. And, and I, I, you asked me what was the motivation <coughs> for writing this book. One of the motivations is mm. the, the general dearth of knowledge, lack of lack knowledge of, of how the British went about their colonial enterprise. You know, how did they deal with the local traditional institutions such as the Kingdom of Buganda? Right. Which, they how did they, which, by the way, according with, to a lot of records, they admired enormously. Yes, they did, but they, in order for, for, for their experiment or their project to succeed, they had it to, to deform it. To weaken it. And to weaken it. Correct. And to depose some of its stronger leaders, of like, course, like, Mwanga like Mwanga and Mutesa at some Mutesa. point. Yeah, and replace them 
with a system that was alien. Uh, so on the surface, you, you had a kingdom and a king. With the people that uh, uh, were probably uh, using, their view using malleable. A, exactly, using a system of indirect rule, uh, the real power remained with the colonial masters. But and was it really, how indirect was it really? Well, in the case of Buganda, it was really indirect because we continued to have a functioning Luchiko, for example, Correct. which is our uh, uh, council of elders and, and, and representatives. The Kabaka continued to be in place. Um, we had ministers. So to the eyes of an ordinary innocent person who didn't know much, they would think that it continued Nothing had changed. in true form. But yeah. from, 19, from 1894, once Mwanga entered find into some protection yes of, of protection yes there was an erosion of power so no. so so that the kabaka and the kingdom generally stayed in a position of in a position but without power they couldn't really do a lot of things without consulting absolutely every every, yes, every re government. resolution that was required uh, or passed by the Luchiko, they had to approve it. And if they didn't approve it, it wouldn't be passed. It didn't be passed. And, and, and this applies to, you know, not just Kabaka Mwanga, but also to his uh, father, mm -hmm. Sir Daudi Chua, yes. who they also attempted to, to depose, only that he passed away in 1939. Uh, but they deposed his father, Chua's uh, son, Mutesa II, mm. Uh, once there was a disagreement on policy. 1953, was it? 1953, yes, yes. Which, which sparked off a crisis, mm. a big crisis, and um, led to his uh, deportation Correct. To, to the United to Kingdom. To the UK. Yeah, so there was that kind of politics, and, and not very many people have, have, have understood it from a perspective of, of a Muganda, an African writer, mm -hmm. and this is the attempt that I make in, in, in documenting this history so that we can tell mm. our own story mm -hmm. and so that um, especially the youthful population and other you know, categories can understand how the imp empire mm. impacted on Buganda and in Uganda mm. and the consequences, the legacy of that um, colonization. And of course, as uh, one uh former uh, president of the United States, uh, Richard Nixon, once said when he asked about how he thought history would uh, treat him. Mm. You know, he said, uh, if you want history to be favorable to you, yes. you either write it yourself mm -hmm. or commission someone to write it Church on your you. behalf. <laughs> now, talking yes. about that, mm. you have written, obviously, a very, very interesting book here. Uh, very rich, very well researched, and what have you. Mm -hmm. But someone might say, Apollo, who is the primary, for example, audience of this book? It is the elite, those who, uh, who can access the English language. Yes. What about the ordinary Muganda, for example, the ordinary Ugandan? Yes. That's a challenge. That's a challenge. And... Uh, I'm hoping that with time we are able to break it down and make it accessible both in terms of cost but also in language. The cost is, is, is pretty steep for an ordinary Ugandan, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to start somewhere. Mm. There's information, there's knowledge, mm. and we are doing more than uh, selling the book. I am here, for example, talking to you about the book, mm -hmm. about the history. Mm -hmm. I do this quite a bit. I've been to universities, I've been to public uh, fora on radios and so on mm. to talk about the book. And we have in mind um, plans to, to, to break it down some more so that it can be accessible, especially in schools. Right. Um, the history that we learn in schools um, falls short of telling us the true story, the full story of imperialism, and especially how the British operated in Uganda. And um, so it's my desire that um, with time, mm. more schools, more universities, more kids will get access to this book. We'll have uh, a sort of history that is a reflection 
of the African perspective. Correct. Very interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, these concepts, for example, uh, protectorate. Yes. Uganda was called a protectorate, mm -hmm. where the British uh, decided to use uh, the sophisticated social political institutions that obtained, for example, in Uganda, in Ghana, in South Africa, in Botswana, in all sorts of things, so that uh, it resulted into what you call in your book indirect rule. Yes. And then our neighbor in East Africa, Kenya, was not a protectorate. It was a colony. Mm. As a matter of fact, it was even a step further because it was a settler colony, mm -hmm. which was really uh, not supposed to be politically independent under indigenous African Kenyans. Yes. And then you had also south of us what was called Tanganyika. It was called a territory. Correct. So what was the difference about these There's concepts? a lot of um, language that has been used in the colonial, uh, 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 colonial world. One is, you know, the, what you mentioned, protectorate. In some cases, they were called dominions. Yes, like Canada, uh, yes, Australia. Or Australia. <laughs> yes. Um, in other cases, they were called territories. In other cases, uh, colonies. The net effect was the same. It was one of control. Mm was one of uh, domination by the British mm. over the people and their resources. Mm. Um, in the case of Kenya, it was called a colony because um, I think that the, the, the British tended to have direct, a more direct administration mm. of, of that area, mm. as opposed to, for example, Uganda. They basically took over the land. That's right. The fertile it was, land. It was intended that, you know, they settle. Correct. In fact, they threw off. Just huge, like Rhodesia, which later number. became uh, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe that's right. and Zambia. That's right. So in those areas, they tended to settle much more than, 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 than in others. In the case of Uganda, it was referred to as a protectorate. Again, deriving, Protecting what? deriving this whole notion of protection. What was the understanding from uh, the Buganda perspective of protectorate? When Mwanga was first approached, Mwanga was the Kabaka of Buganda when uh, Lugard first uh, came. Lugard was... Uh, the great was, Mwanga who eventually is uh, uh, deported to Seychelles. That's right. Mm. So, so Captain Lugard was the forerunner of British imperialism in Uganda. That is the one who set up uh, the fort on Old Kampala Hill? That's right. They that's used right. to call it Kapere. That's right. Ka <laughs> Captain, Captain, <laughs> Captain Lugard was Kapere. Yes, yes. So, so he set, set up a commercial enterprise. Initially, it was uh, his company, the Imperial British East African Company, Correct. was given a concession to manage that whole territory. And whatever proceeds they would get, they would privatize them or share some with, with the British government. But they ran bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Captain Rugard's business ran bankrupt. So they ran to Gladstone and others to, in the British government to, to, to seek the government to take over formally uh, the, 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 the territory called Uganda. Right. So um, Gerald Porto and others came down and, and, and entered into some kind of agreement with Mwanga mm -hmm. prior to the actual uh, colonial colonial takeover. Right. So in this agreement, it was stated that in return for its sovereignty, mm -hmm. Buganda would get protection from the British. And you asked a valid question, protection from who, from what, and, and why? Right, and for who really? And, and, and protection was, was, was interestingly not from any entity within Buganda, but it was from the other colonizing power, the Germans. Okay. Germany, yes. Germany had uh, another company. It was one of it was in fashion at that, that time. Was, uh, one of these commercial Carl, companies. Carl Peters, I remember. Carl Peters. Yes. Carl Peters was a German um, equivalent of Captain, Captain Lugard. And his mission was to acquire as many territories and plant so many flags wherever he could. Mm. In the case of Buganda, Carl Peters arrived at Mengo. Before, before Lugard, Lugard correct. Did. Mm. And he signed another treaty of protection, another treaty of uh, protection. 
But once the British learned that uh, Carl Peters had beaten them to the game mm. and they wanted to have connection with uh, Sudan, with the source of the Nile, Egypt, they needed to control, right, to control yeah. that area. So yes. they entered into a pact. Mm -hmm. Britain entered into a pact with, with Germany, of course unknown to the Baganda or to Mwanga, whereby they would exchange an island. It was called Heligol. Yes, I remember Hel that one. Heligoland. Yes. yes. It's a small island. Yeah. Uh, so the Germans surrendered Uganda and Buganda to the Correct. British Correct. so that they could have this whole sphere of influence along the Nile and in return took over this British island called Heligoland. Heligoland. So, um, to go back to the core concept of protection, mm. really the idea was not protecting the people and the kingdoms that they sought to protect. In fact, when you look at the uh, details of the agreements, mm. it was an, they were agreements of exploitation, they were agreements of surrender, of territory, of power, mm. of army, mm. of, of minerals. So it was or, really protection of what you would call British vital interest. national security interests. Strategic interests, that's right. But now when you talk about treaties, agreements being signed and what have you, in what language were, uh, were these those treaties? treaties and agreements written? That's a fundamental question. Because the, 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 the negotiations, first of all, they, they purported to go through some kind of negotiation. Right. Facilitated, in the case of Buganda and the 1900 agreement, it was facilitated by the British missionaries. The missionaries. Yes, because they understood the language. They were the translators. They were the translators and they were mediators. The interpreters. They were mediators between the local chiefs and the colonial powers. How independent-minded were they? Of course they were not, they were not <laughs> independent-minded. And in many cases, if you read uh, Bishop Stewart and so on, they did a lot to facilitate the penetration of colonial rule in, in Uganda. They Would were, we say they, enablers? They were enablers yes. in, in, in many ways. So the question is, were they the treaties in the true sense really? of, of, of the law, or were they just... Uh, 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 fraudulent uh, and you know you could call them a uh, fuss basically because the people who were signing these treaties hardly when Kabaka understood. Manga is signing for example does he really know what he's signing he, he, he hardly knew he hardly understood he hardly appreciated and that's why a few weeks after he had signed with Lugard he, 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 he pulled down the British flag at Mengo and put the Buganda flag. Yes. And for that reason, he paid a heavy price. <laughs> Interesting. You know, they attacked. They attacked the British, led by uh, Johnson and, and Lugard. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Mwanda Apollo, uh, there is no democracy in Studio Forty Seven. When a producer says you go for a break, you have Problem. to go like a good soldier. You salute. Thank you. Thank you. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. Being part of Our Voices is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories and our voices will help shape the next generation. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. Every week, connect with our experts. You can ask them your questions and get their advice. Join me, Lina Hamoudou, in Washington on Healthy Living, your new health program right here on Voice of America. We appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can watch our show there and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on top for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, the complicated legacy of Daniel Arab Moy. Kenya's second president and longest serving leader has died at 95. His critics say Moy was a dictator who ruled with an iron fist. 
His supporters say he was a kind man who actively promoted education for all of Kenya's citizens. The legacy of Daniel Arab Moy on the next Straight Talk Africa. And today we are discussing the kingdom of Buganda's past and present. Our guest is Aporo Nelson Makubuya, Chief Paris Advisor for the Ugandan Kingdom of Buganda. He is also the author of Protection, Patronage, Oplanda, British Machinations and Buganda's Struggle for Independence. Well, Apollo, once again, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time on Thank Straight you. Talk Africa. Thank you. You're most welcome. Shaka, it's always a pleasure to talk and to be here is an enormous uh, uh, honor. I can assure you that uh, the feeling is mutual. Thank you. Apollo. Thank you. You're most welcome. Mm. Now, you were talking, of course, um, I cut you short uh, because, as I said, there is no democracy in Studio 47. Mm -hmm. When the producer says go, you have to go. So yes. I hope you can find some space in your beautiful Ugandan heart to forgive me for that. That's fine, that's fine. Could yes, I was talking, I was talking about, you, you asked me about treaty making. Correct. And um, how serious the treaties that were made between African chiefs right. and uh, colonial masters right. were. Um, and I was giving you examples of how Mwanga, for example, when he first signed the treaty with, with Britain, you know, um, repudiated it in a, in a few in a few days, in a few weeks, but he paid a heavy price for Why that. Why did he repudiate it? Uh, because he, he, he realized that in, his, in the language that he used that the British were after all not here to protect him right. or his interest, but to use the words, he, they were there to eat his country. Right. They, that, this is the language right. that he used. To, <laughs> they were there to eat his country. Right. Um, because once, once they were established, Lugard especially, he, 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 he tended now to take sides, for example, with certain parts of the subjects of Buganda, of the mm -hmm, king, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, fermented wars, for example, between the Christians and the Catholics. And the Catholics, yes. Uh, uh, and so on, which led to this uh, big war in 18... Um, 92, I believe. So he basically the first Mengo, introduced uh, Battle of Mengo, sectarianism, really. Battle of Mengo. Mm. And we don't learn about this history in our schools, about the atrocities and violations that were committed by these British uh, colonial administrators mm. and military fellows. Um, but instead, you hear about how brutal Mwanga was having ordered for the murder of uh, Bishop Huntington. Yes. Or having, uh, you know, led to the massacre the of the killing of the Christian converts. But yes. when you compare the deeds of Mwanga right. to those of Lugat... The colonial and, state. And, 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 yeah, they are yeah. incomparable. So are incomparable. when you talk about uh, Mwanga figuring it out, uh, is this part of the reason why he joined his old adversary? Yes. The king of Bunyoro Chitara, yes. Kabarega. Correct. <laughs> I mean, Kabarega and Mwanga were always um, adversaries because of you know, competition for land and, and all the civil, civil, civil strife. Mm -hmm. But when, once they were faced with a common enemy right. in the form of Brit the British Empire, mm -hmm. they teamed up. They were, they were fig fugitives. You know, they, they had to defend their territory. They had to defend themselves and survive. And that's why they Eventually, formed this alliance. But yes. unfortunately, you know, with the collaboration with, of some of our own people, some of our own, um, the, the British overcame them they, right. and, and had to humiliate them. And uh, in the case of Kavalega, he was amputated. His arm was cut off. And uh, in the case of um, uh, Mwanga, both of them had to be paraded, in, you know, humiliated in the public and, 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 and uh, deported to, to Sheshels. The thing is, when you read the history of Uganda, mm. you will hear more about, you know, what Sapolo Kagwa did, what Smeka Kunglu did, mm. uh, more than you will hear other people who resisted imperialism, you know, people like uh, uh, Kavalega and Mwanga, uh, people like 
there are some generals in the army, Gabriel Chintu. I don't mm. know whether you've, mm. have, yeah. you've ever heard mm. of Gabriel yeah. Chintu. Yeah. Mm. These guys do not future prominently in our history. And this is why we need to tell our because own stories. Because we don't write our own history. We need to write our own stories. Let me go the, to most, the last bit of humiliation was uh, mm. because, you see, Mwanga and Kavalega had resisted being baptized. Uh, baptized, you know. Converting so how did, how did Mwanga become Daniel? <laughs> and, and, and how did Kavalega become John? They were forcefully baptized Interesting. just before they were boarded, forcefully boarded on a ship. To Seychelles. To Seychelles. Yes. Very interesting. I gather that uh, we do have uh, um, a call from the Ugandan capital, Kampala. Yes. Uh, could we please uh, uh, ask what? Yes, yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Ndugu. Yes, good evening, um, Mr. Sakasulu and uh, Senior Council, Apple Makubuya. Yes, yes. Good evening. what is your name? My name is uh, Asua Kamiya. Asua, Asua, Asua. Kamiya. Okay, go ahead, please. What is your question? Yes, my question is, um, considering the um, implications of, of the Buganda agreement, on our current politics. Uh, pardon, please? Go ahead, please. What's yes, my question is, um, what... Are, are you getting me? Yes, yes please. we can hear you. Oh, yes, please. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask... Uh, um, Senior Council Makubia. Yes, please. About the lesson that uh, we can draw as a country from our uh, history dating back to the colonial time. What have we done differently? Hmm? Are, 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 there, are, there, are there some positives we learned from that uh, uh, whole relationship that we had with British? Is there any change? And if so, uh, what I think for the better. Thank you. Okay, yes. Um, there's a lot to learn from our history, and this is the whole reason why we, we write this book. That uh, This is the whole reason we, we, we delve into our history so as to understand, you know, what happened and how that history has helped to shape or define our contemporary politics. Mm. So, so we, there's a lot to learn, many lessons. Um, for example, on, on one hand, this whole exploitative tendency of, of colonial rule and the legacy of colonialism and how it continues to impact on our politics, on mm. our economy, on our social uh, structures and so on. And um, we, we need to learn about that and how the British went about doing what they did. Mm. Because, believe me or not, we are now faced with a different force, what some people have called a new scramble. It's so like internal colonialism. Well, there's internal colonialism, but there are also external forces. You're talking about from, from uh, China, from India, from Russia, from Europe, and Britain once again is knocking on our doors. They want to to enter into new relationships following Brexit. Because of Brexit. Uh, yeah, so they want mm. to enter into new trade deals. They want to enter into new uh, relationships or partnerships. They want to be, mm. um, you know, champions of free trade. Yes. So we need to sit back and and think about how the history that we've ha had uh, shows us or, or teaches us on, on how we need to deal with the current uh, forces that we are faced with. It is interesting that uh, you mentioned that uh, because uh, I was wondering, because when you think about uh, those types of uh, deals that you are talking about, uh, one should imagine Africa as an incredibly beautiful woman. Yes and that this woman is being courted by Russians, by Chinese, by Germans, and you name it. But as our traditions, you know, uh, suggest, is it the parents of the beautiful girl that are going to the parents of the individual who is courting the lady? 
Because why do Africans go to Berlin, for example, to have these meetings, really, which are talking about their resources? Yes. Why do they go to Moscow to talk about the same thing? It why is, is it that Moscow does not come to Africa, or the Chinese don't come to Africa, or the Germans? It's a continuing paradox, in fact. Uh, Africa's resources uh, have been a target, you know, for many years. You know, some people think that uh, there was a break once we got independence in the 1960s and so on, uh, of this interest of, and perception of Africa as a market. Some call it political flag independence. It was nominal, nominal independence. And there continued to be a power relation mm -hmm. between the West and Africa in particular uh, that had uneven players or, or, or power relations. But isn't that because of what some critics have suggested, that uh, we are talking here really about uh, leadership deficit in Africa? You could say that. It's a combination of things. There's, there's a problem, a challenge that we have in Africa as, as far as leadership is concerned. But, but there's, there's, there's a hope that once we are more aware mm -hmm. about how these forces are operate and what their right. interests are, exactly. you know, we, we will be able to confront these forces. And what about the us? Do we know our interests? Any particular reason why we cannot identify our interests? I, I think we know our interests, but uh, sometimes we feel uh, marginalized because the way we are stratified as countries. For example, you know, Rwanda or Uganda or Kenya, in their individual independence mm, state, mm. you know, they want to go and negotiate with the Russians, you know, with the Chinese, with, with the British. Mm. We, we are so weak. Very weak. As, as individual countries. Hence the need and for the need what for, Nkrumah, for, Nkrumah's dream was, the United States of Africa. Correct. And, and if you know about the uh, new agreement, the Africa Continental, Continental Free Trade, Trade Area, yes. I think that it's a move in the right direction. It's a move in the right direction. Whereby we can do more trade amongst each other, more intra-African trade. Right. Uh, whereby we can bargain right. better as, right. as, as, as a continent. Right. And so on. So... Um, I hope that the leadership we learn from this history mm. and, uh, you know, forge more uh, partnerships on the continent. Yes. You know, you look at a country like Angola or Nigeria with the, or, or Congo, the Democratic Republic, Republic of, Congo, of Congo, you know, they are resource rich. They don't need any, any aid from anybody as to develop ma their countries. As a matter of fact, uh, some scholars at one time suggested that uh, when it comes to minerals, for example, mm -hmm. the Congo is a geological scandal. It is a scandal. And you wonder how a few people can sit today, 2020, in London to talk about a, an effort by the British government mm. and the investors in Britain to transform Africa. Exactly. Yeah. It, 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 there's a way in which it, it resonates with the old civilizing mission, African development to mission, stand up to the plate. modernization mission. Yes. Yet we have all it takes in terms of the brain power, in terms of the resources. We are the richest. In terms of the in population. In terms of wealth, resources, in but terms of the market, our people are the poorest. Yeah, we have it. Yeah. We have it. And um, so what, what this means, and I, this is the value that we get once we do more and more research. I sometimes, you know, uh, use the example of China. Yes. Uh, which is an emerging superpower. Yes, it the is a superpower, largest, more or less. The second largest economy right now. Oh. In fact, it is dubbed as uh, the world's factory, really. Yes. Where does it get the resources that have, in fact, transformed it into that? From Africa. If you talk about uh, oil, you, were, you just mentioned Angola. Yes. You talk about Nigeria, and you name it. When you talk about uh, copper, mm -hmm. cobalt, mm -hmm. you talk about Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia, yes. and you name it. Yes. What about Africa? 
You see, and this is, Shaka, the challenge that we have on the continent because we tend to see, you know, Africa rising and the growth, people touting this whole, uh, Africa is the fastest growth uh, area in terms of the economics. But you see, but growth, how can you even, how can growth you even in terms of those infrastructure. Statistics. Those statistics could, in fact, even be reflections of creative accounting. <laughs> You know, we need to look mm -hmm. into those. Mm -hmm. but, but you see, this growth is, is, is shown by the level of, of investments from the West yeah. into Africa, mm. you know, foreign direct investments. But when it comes to, 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 to development, yes. it's a different game. Growth is one thing, development is, is another, another thing. Because those statistics that are touted tell me whether, in fact, they are reflected in people's stomachs and livelihoods. or people's in neighborhoods. Yeah, it's, it's, it's this, you know, people talk about a, a rising middle class in mm, Africa, mm, but, mm. you know, it's a very small section very of, small of section the population. Very small section you can find in Nairobi. The majority of the people in Africa continue to suffer. Peasants, really? Um, poverty. Yeah. And under development, their social circumstances have not been transformed because of this increased uh, FDIs. Exactly. So I, have, I have a question here from one Kenneth. Asafu Sesanga, who has a case uh, for you. He says, recently, Mr. Makubuya advised the KCCA. Is this Kampara City Council yes. Authority? That's right. To rename all Kampara roads named after whites with Ugandan names. Does he want to erase the historical side of our country? Some of these people were bishops and clergymen who did a lot in matters of education and health. Why should we forget their good work? <laughs> yes, I'm very happy that he has raised that. It's part of what I'm doing about decolonization. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find when you come to Kampala, and, and you've been there a few times, you, you know that um, many of our prominent streets in, in the city are named after some of these... Uh, colonial administrators who are responsible for, you know, those atrocities that I mentioned. Yes. And I see no reason why we should uh, give them that prominency. I see no reason why we should glorify them or celebrate them, uh, especially in the face of, 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 of their history. And I suspect that it's because we, we, we don't have as much knowledge mm. about people like De Winton, people yes, like... Of course. Uh, uh, Colville, people yes. like uh, Lugard, Pil people like Pilkington. You know, there's a Pilkington Road, and you ask yourself, how many Ugandans understand what Pilkington represented Relate with as, as a yeah, formation of the kind colony? Of we even have a, a road in, in Kololo. Kololo is a, an up a market uh, suburb yes. uh, for the more affluent members of our society. Uh, named after the King's African Rifles. Would you believe it? <laughs> really? Yes, <laughs> King's the African one that Rifles. Used to harass us. Exactly. So, um, to, to, to respond, we are not talking about erasure of history. As a matter of fact, by writing these books, mm. we are um, ensuring that this history is, uh, is, is re documented, recorded, and kept for, for posterity. My challenge or my concern really is uh, we shouldn't give prominence to people who are responsible for the violation of rights of our people, who are responsible for the exploitation of, of our communities, who are responsible for the deformation and dismantling mm. of our traditional institutions in place of, 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 of their own. Let me ask you, in fact, a question that uh, I keep running into uh, with a lot of people who I've been to Uganda or look at uh, some Ugandan literature and wonder about this great lake. Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria. <laughs> yes. Wasn't it called, uh, in some circles, Lake Narubari? Yes. Um, in fact, <laughs> it's I, have, part of the... I have a friend whose daughter is named Victoria. Yeah. And it's part of the legacy. Me, and I, I always say, why, why do you call her Victoria? Why not Naruvali or something of that sort? Yes, it's part of a legacy. It's part of a legacy that continues, you know, a colonial legacy. Um, Even and that after we, are, we, we are dream to be free? Uh, uh, free and independent. But I want to, 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 
try and uh, fathom uh, an explanation why people are not so concerned about this repre re representation of colonial domination. Mm. I, I think that um, after independence, our country uh, descended into some disorder, mm. political disorder, militarism. And, and people have not had sufficient time to reflect on, on the history. We are more concerned about our day-to-day -day survival mm. and so on. But I think that with time, people will recognize a need to revisit some of these names. You know, you have a Lake Victoria. It's as if before the, the British came, this lake didn't exist or didn't have a name. You know, we have many of our prominent futures in the country, you know, Lake Edward, Lake, Edward, lake yes, Albert, you yes. have Markshon Falls, you have a big national park named after Queen Elizabeth. River Nile. Uh, River Nile and so on. You know, it's a, a, a demeaning in a way of our identity mm. and, uh, and mis misrepresenting our history or, or, or destroying our history because Nalu Valley is a name of the lake. Yes. You know, these lakes existed before colonial rule. Someone might, of course, ask you, well, on the Ugandan side, it might be Nalu Valley. What would it be on the side of Tanzania? And what would it be on the side of Kenya? Yes, so, so, yes. So, so, so this is part of the process of decolonization. And, and I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the issue is uh, you know, being addressed at home. Mm. I'm hopeful that um, you know, for those personalities, such as the religious leaders and so mm. on, mm. who represent the good side mm. of colonial rule, if anything like that exists, mm. or who represent good human endeavor and achievement, you know, I have no problems with those. Sir Albert Cook, for example, yes. you know, was a prominent doctor yes. who helped to develop the health systems in Uganda. Yes. I have no problem with the road being named after Sir Albert Cook. But I have a big, big problem with Fort Lugard. Your point, man. With, with, yeah, with, definitely. With, Kapiri, with, with, Kapiri, Kapiri man, with, yes. With Colville, with Tanman, and mm. so on, because these guys we are responsible for the situation, part of the problems that we face today. In, in, you your, in your book, uh, time, of course, is not our best ally, but yes. in your book, you sort of uh, uh, essentially demonstrated that uh, we, we may have, in fact, become politically independent, mm -hmm. but in terms of the manner in which we govern ourselves, yes. we have retained the same colonial template. In fact, there is uh, a friend of mine who used to be uh, a sort of analyst on Straight Talk Africa, a professor, uh, George Ayite, yes. uh, who once said that uh, most African leaders retain the same political vehicle yes. that was used to colonize us. That all we have been really experiencing is changing the driver. <laughs> that what is really needed yes. is a paradigm shift. That's right, that's right, and I support that view. I support that view because, you know, what, what, what was colonialism characterized by? It was typified by oppression, by un being undemocratic, very you know, undemocratic in terms of governance. Yes. It, was, it was identified with corruption. You know, I've told you how some many of our chiefs were corrupted with, with gifts and land and so on, so as to, to side with the British powers. Well. Um, this, this militarism, mm. I talked about Lugard and, and the fact that he used the violence of the Maxim gun to take over. Unfortunately, the time happened not to be our best ally, yes. and so on that note, our guest was Apollo Nelson Makubuya. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Buganda. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.